Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Secure Talk. Secure Talk is brought to you by Adequest, your cybersecurity and compliance partner. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Secure Talk. Today, we're being joined by Dr. Chris Spencer, who is the Chief Information Security Officer, or CISO, for Global Reach and Nomadics. Uh, Chris has a tremendous amount of experience in the uh, Wi-Fi industry, and we're going to talk a little bit about best practices related to public Wi-Fi, et cetera. Hey, Chris, how are you? Hi, Mark. Welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me onto your uh, podcast. Yep, my pleasure. Well. My pleasure. Hey, um, I always like to ask people where they are. Um, so I, I'm on the West Coast, Seattle. Um, whereabouts are you located right now? Uh, so if anybody's seen the Robin Hood film, uh, I'm familiar with Robin Hood in the UK. I'm in Nottinghamshire. Nottinghamshire. Uh, it's a real place. It's okay, a real I, place. I, <laughs> yeah. Because I think in Robin Hood, and at least our version, it was the, the Nottingham Forest, right? Yeah. Is uh, that a real place? Yeah, I was yeah. literally in Nottingham Forest uh, last weekend. We we took the family and the kids out for a walk. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's so, a real so is it, I, I mean, I'm just curious now. Um, has nothing to do with uh, cybersecurity, but uh, is the Robin Hood character based on any historical person? Supposedly, supposedly, okay. you know, uh, I, I guess sometimes myth and legend gets a little bit uh, intertwined. Uh, but yeah, we have a tree we refer to as the Major Oak. Uh, mm -hmm. which supposedly Robin, uh, hiding from the Sheriff of Nottingham, ducked into, and uh, it's got a you know hole in the base of the tree, and he ducked into it and escaped that uh, particular so, encounter. And yeah, yeah. So we'd like uh, to like to believe that it was all, you know, yeah, as it's made out to be. Yeah. Fascinating. How how are things there? Uh, you know, COVID wise, are things starting to open up? It's a very strange world. Uh, Mark, to be honest, we live in. Uh, I, I've, I've worked remote now from our office for probably a year. Mm -hmm. um, things are starting to, um, uh, what's the word, uh, be more allowed. You know, we can have more people to gather in and things like that. But we've still got face masks. We've still got, you know, to when if we if we go to a restaurant, we we, we use an app to scan into to let them know that we're we're there and things like that so uh, i think we have another big announcement in a week or two of what our next um, ease of those restrictions may or may not be um, mm -hmm. we've got a particular strong variant uh sort of flowing through our country at the moment so we're just watching uh, our figures well finger, finger, fingers crossed that things will continue to improve um yeah. you, you know here in the states Anybody who wants to get vaccinated has been vaccinated. Um, and, you know, so it's it's kind of interesting to see how that plays out, because if we don't have a critical mass, then you leave a window of opportunity open for future problems. But but for the time being, things are looking better. Yeah. Um, but, you know, because of covid, uh, we've seen a, a a massive movement from work from home. Uh, and 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 the use of home Wi-Fi and public Wi-Fi uh, hotspots. You have a, 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 as I mentioned earlier, a tremendous amount of experience, over two decades of experience um, in that kind of sector, and um, and you've done done a lot of work related to best practices, it related to you know uh, single sign-on, uh, passpoint, um, and then you're also you know starting to work on next generation uh, hotspot technology. Maybe you could, um, you know, t in the context of what's going on in the world and and people being heavily dependent on home Wi-Fi uh, and, you know, public hotspots, public Wi-Fi, et cetera, w you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the concerns and then related best practices. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And I think, you know, you can put things into different classes as well. So you mentioned their public Wi-Fi versus your home Wi-Fi and things like that. So you, you, you can put different parameters around that. You know, home Wi-Fi, if I was asked to think of a few things for best practices for home Wi-Fi, make sure you've got a password on your Wi-Fi. It, it might sound really, you know, a, a really low thing to the people that are in the technical industry and familiar with those things. But we see it, it's so many access points are still open you know, people can physically connect to that access point. Uh, and some people see, you know, don't understand what that means. You know, it means your neighbor can connect to your Wi-Fi. 
And if you've got uh, smart devices, and I think we'll talk about this within the MDU space as well, but if we look at smart homes, IoT devices coming into our homes, uh, and again, the phrase IoT, uh, it's a phrase we often refer to, but actually we've had IoT devices for so many years now, you know, from cameras uh, that we used to put inside our homes. Uh, and this is, it's, it's actually one of the interesting things from what, probably for another time, but that got me into the security uh, space uh, and starting to think that way. Wi-Fi has always been my passion. It's absolutely mm -hmm. always been my, my my passion and improving that and getting that. But security came by because I was using devices on my Wi-Fi. And one was uh, this uh, particular teddy bear, believe it or not. It was a, <laughs> uh, yeah, a cuddly teddy bear. And I, in all honesty, I bought it because I was doing lots of travel and I wanted, I saw it advertised and thought, hey, this is great. It connects to my Wi-Fi. Um, there's an app on my phone. I can speak into that app and the teddy bear's heart glows. My oh. daughter can press that <laughs> and listen to a 30 second audio uh, That's... voice from me and she can do the same. And I thought, how cute is that? Then the alarm bell started ringing in there when I actually came to use it. You logged into a website, um, you entered uh, your home location as part of all of the, 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 the like, warranty and the sign up, but you registered your Wi-Fi network to a location. So I could see from the app whether the teddy bear was at home or at my mother-in-law's. So I knew if my daughter was at home or my mother-in-law's. And you know, what, what seems as a, a very, very uh, innocent conversation started to think in my head, you know, I could go, uh, hey, Melody, I can see you're at grandma's, daddy's traveling, I'll be home Sunday, looking forward to seeing you. Right. And then you start to question, what have I just said in that 15 second soundbite there? I've given my daughter's name away. Mm -hmm. I'm not at home because I don't get home till next week. Um, she's at my grandma's, at my mother-in-law, sorry. Um, so my home is potentially empty. Right. Where is that audio clip stored? How is it managed? How is it maintained? How is it deleted? Privacy and things like that. What, is, what if a breach? Can they listen to the audio when the button's not pressed on the teddy bear? All of those things started going through my head. And then that's where I started to go into the security side of things and start it all started from this, this this teddy bear if you like but started to get me interested in that other side of what ifs so going back to your question around you know home wi-fi make sure you've got a password on there uh, wpa2 at least a lot of the new access points that are coming out support wpa3 um, um, we have had uh, issues with w WPA2, uh, so WPA3 is there, you know, you should be using that. Um, make sure, and some of these apply to um, uh, public Wi-Fi as well, um, but I'll specifically speak about public in a second. But your home Wi-Fi, I would say, make sure you've got a, a reasonably strong password on there for the devices. Um, Make sure your firmware is up to date on your uh, router or your modem. Um, how, how do you how do you do that? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, again, this this comes down to the awareness of knowing your own appliances. If your router is provided by your ISP, then typically your ISP may manage that, but they also may not. It's worth knowing where the responsibility lies for that. So it's sort of put that in the awareness category. Um, uh, but look up the make and model of your router, your uh, modem. Go to that manufacturer's website. Look at the firmware. They should have support guides. They should have help guides uh, to do that. But often the firmware upgrades not just give you new fancy new features, but they will often be security fixes in there, security patches in there. Um, most routers, if they've got a web interface, they've got a web server on there. Um, you know, a few years ago, a major brand had that particular issue, they found a way to do a, a, a content injection into that web browser and were able to rewrite the DNS servers settings on millions of routers. Now those, now, now, now they've got access to the router, they can intercept your traffic and redirect that traffic to where they want. And they weren't doing anything like redirecting your bank to, to, to a different bank account or anything like that. 
they were literally using the ad revenue of you would go to a website and it would redirect you to something first and you'd end up seeing an advert. Those particular people would get the revenue from the adverts and so on like that. Um, you looked at some of the, uh, the, the breaches and uh, breaches is a strange word, but some of the um, uh, viruses and, and malware and content and data injections that are happening now, a lot of it is based around trying to do cryptocurrency. You know, if you're a little router can have a piece of JavaScript on there, that's mining a little bit in the background. Do you do you notice? Do you know? You know, are you checking those kinds of things? Uh, so home Wi-Fi, um, make sure you've got a password. Keep your firmware up to date on there. Uh, some of the routers allow you to log in and actually see devices that are connected. Might mm -hmm. be worth every so often just checking. Is there anything in there you don't recognize? You know, and a lot of them that have that function will have an option to block it. So if you don't recognize it, block it, see what stops working in your home, rectify it uh, and move on. Now, there are probably a few tips for home users. Um, there's, there's probably many more, you know, like keeping your, your actual devices themselves up to date. But if we go into, which we'll, we'll probably speak about when we go to MDUs and things like that. But if we look at public Wi-Fi, um, you often see, you know, uh, the press people like to pick up on the fact that an open network is an open network. Um, you know, and don't use it for this and don't use it for that. But be sensible, take take precautions. If you are going into a coffee shop and you know that coffee shop's brand, you know, look for their brand of Wi-Fi. Don't use something that says, hey, click me or free Wi-Fi. You know, you, you sort of have to use a little bit of your, your, your common sense of, you know, if it's uh, there's sort of an old saying, isn't there, if it's uh, if it sounds too good to be, you know, true, true it probably no is. And right. Yeah, yeah. So use those kinds of things. And it's often very hard. You know, you go into these locations like an airport and the, the user opens their device and they'll see hundreds of Wi-Fi networks. Now, which one should they use? Those kinds of things. So, you know, look for the brand names, the, you know, the good reputable names and, and connect to them. When in a, in a public Wi-Fi scenario, you're typically redirected to a captive portal. We refer to it as a captive portal, a login page or a registration page in, in, in terms. And there's usually, a, typically, there's an exchange of information at that point, you know, and you, mm -hmm. you've got to sort of think about the business side of it compared to what you're getting back. You know, why does the business want this information? Why am I giving that information? There's an exchange there, typically of some form of value. It might be free Wi-Fi, but they get your email address. It might be free Wi-Fi, but they get your mobile number. So just, uh, it's it's you know everybody should read terms and conditions, but nobody does. We 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 often see that in those kinds of scenarios. Uh, but look for the glaringly quick, obvious things that in there. Are they going to sell your data? You know, you know, and is that is that still of value to you? If you right. know that they're going to do those kinds of things, um, you know, but there's usually some form of exchange of data, but you go through that process and you typically then gain internet access. So you, you need to look at that and understand that exchange of data first, the amount of data you're giving, you know, do they want my inside leg measurement? Is that relevant? <laughs> you know, you know, those kinds of things. You know, if I'm in a, a pizza shop and they ask me for my email address and, you know, uh, what's my favorite pizza topping, you could expect that kind of thing. But then if they're also asking what car I drive, why would a pizza shop need to know what car I drive? You know, just, just ask those questions, because are they trying to build a profile around you that they could potentially sell? So just look at those kinds of things. But then when now you've actually got internet access, think about the things you're, you're, you're doing uh, on that. You know, if, you've, if you've got access to a VPN, I would recommend you, you, know, you have a VPN in there. Uh, a VPN uh, is a virtual private network. They're offered again. You can you can purchase these online, uh, and a subscription service that will give you that kind of uh, benefit, where it will um, encapsulate your traffic between your device, the access point, the person that controls the access point, you know, out to the internet, and will give you some form of protection around how many people can eavesdrop on your kind of thing. But bear in mind that in an open network, your access, your 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 your, your laptop or your, your smartphone or your, your device talks to that access point in the in the clear in essence. 
So mm -hmm. because it's in the clear, you want to make sure that your traffic that you are sending is encrypted. So VPN, uh, only communicate with websites that have the HTTPS on. Years ago when we used to do the training and things, you'd look for a little padlock, but uh, you know, those kind of things have, have gone now. But look for you know, HTTPS. Is there an S there? S for security, you know, is, is that there? So that when you're changing, when you're exchanging data with that site that you're going to, you know that it's encrypted in both ways to and from you. Let, let me ask you this, when you're using public Wi-Fi, you know, I always feel that I should never do anything sensitive, like access my bank account, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time though, if, if I'm using MFA or multi-factor authentication, doesn't that provide, a, a, does it provide an extra level of security or is is it not enough? It does provide an extra level of security, uh, but you've got to think that, you know, uh, that there are always exploits coming out all the time. Uh, if somebody can, uh, uh, for, I don't want to go into the, you know, the, the, the proper low level stuff, uh, but if somebody was inside that location with you at that time, um, and there wasn't isolation correctly configured on the access point, lay to isolation on the access point. If they could clone themselves as your MAC address, could they pick up your session and continue your session after you've authenticated it? Now there's a lot of there's a lot of attributes that need to align for those kind of, you know, I don't don't, don't want to go and genuinely scare the general public. There's a lot of things that need to, you know, this is not a simple thing to do. But those kinds of things where somebody can intercept that then session that is set up and take over that session again things like vpns will make that a lot more uh, a lot harder to do and things like that but yeah try and try and limit the sensitive things that you need to do in some cases you have no choice we do it from our mobile phones we access our banking from our mobile phones you know those kinds of things so just try and limit again common sense and also physical physical security is also super important. You know, there's lots of aspects to security. I know we're talking about cyber security, but you know, can people see what's on your screen? Sure. And somebody take a photo of that. Is that mm -hmm. incriminating you in any way? Is there personal data there that you're, you know, you might be working, but you've got personal data that you've got permission to see. Somebody takes a photo of that, somebody uploads that to social media. You've actually got a breach of data there at that point from something you know, it could even be an innocent photo. It could just be, you know, a couple taking, you know, holding the camera out, taking a selfie of them. You're in the back, but you've got something up on your screen. Um, so just think about those kinds of things as well when you start. No, that's all very good advice. I am curious then, are you pretty, you know, religious about using uh, your personal hotspot versus public Wi-Fi? Or is it like, you know... Uh, Again, it depends on so so it depends on what I'm actually trying to achieve. You know, mm -hmm. certain things. If I if I need to send an email that is is that's not going to have sensitive information because our our, corp, our our company as a policy uses encrypted mail anyway. You know, I, I, the road warrior in me would fire up my VPN and you know make sure I've got secure communication to my mail server and send that mail. Um, I personally wouldn't do my banking in those types of situations. Um, but you know, I don't. I don't see as a need because of the other facilities I have at my hands. I don't need to do that, so I don't do that kind of thing. Um, and w uh, right now we're talking about public open Wi-Fi. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it sort of leads on to the next generation of where we're going with things like Passpoint. So okay. it's often referred to as Hotspot Two, but uh, uh, pa Passpoint is a technology uh, that was built from the ground up using, if you like, the best of other pieces of technology. There's really only one new component to Passpoint, and that's something called 802.11u, which is uh, to do with the ANQP me sorry, um, uh, messaging between the access point and the client's devices to solve the problem of knowing which network to select when you the, the airport analogy I gave you a few minutes ago of which SSID do I click on. Uh, well, within Passpoint, that's all gone. The SSID doesn't play that kind of a role in there. There's an advertisement protocol, um, something called ANQP, Access Network Query Protocol, that allows the device and the access point to communicate to understand whether I, uh, th there's a number of steps to go through that, but basically it's telling me whether I should or shouldn't attempt to connect to that network. Um, 
Then we come down to the security level. So we have uh, 802.11i for the in-air components. We have 802.11x for the security components. So we're usually typically doing EAP-based authentication. Um, so it gets rid of a lot of those issues we have with open hotspots. You know, my in-air, my data is encrypted between me and my access point always. I'm only ever going to connect to an access point that truly is the access point it's saying it is, because as part of that initial discovery process, uh, there's a challenge that says, you know, I want to create an EAP uh, authentication tunnel from my device through the access point to my AAA server, my identity server. If that can't happen, then we don't believe the access point is who he says he is. So I'm not going to connect to that access point anymore. So you get away with those man in the middle or rogue honeypot access point scenarios with hotspot two. Um, it becomes more a more seamless experience. It becomes a very much like a mobile experience. I often describe it. It's just like when I step off a phone abroad. Uh, my phone takes a, a few seconds to hunt for the mobile signal. Does a, a carrier interconnect check exchange uh, to work out whether I can roam onto that network. I then connect to that network. That's all done for me automatically. My identity is only known by my identity provider, my cell phone provider, and it's exactly the same with Passpoint. So it helps with all of those public um, issues that we previously said around open. And we how how far away are we from having that everywhere? Um, it's available today. It's actually something that Global Reach specialises in. That's um, uh, and delivers and Nomadics provides the, the, the policy and the control around that. So it's actually something we deliver today. Um, it's being adopted, um, where, but I, I, there's, again, there's this awareness and training of what that is and how that can benefit and how that is rolled out and utilised uh, by these organisations. Um, I, I can give you one statistic. We have a large network in New York City. Um, we do around five and a half million sessions a day just in New York City. Um, so the technology is there. It's very robust. It's very mature. It's uh, being rolled out all over the place. Um, I, it's not as ubiquitous as, uh, as as you was referring to as public Wi-Fi, open Wi-Fi, uh, but it, we are going the right path. We are following that path. You know, handsets, operating systems, all the major operating systems now support that technology. So it's mm -hmm. being rolled out. Um, there's even advances to that technology um, called, uh, with, with initiatives like open roaming that allows networks to join together seamlessly. So it becomes this single experience for the guest or the user uh, as the, you know, the traveler as they're traveling around really. Um, and ticks off all of those security issues that we potentially see with an open network. That, that's great. What um, when you refer to next generation hotspot, is that is that what you're talking there? Is that yeah, yeah, there was, there... There was, yes, within within the the, the industry, there, there's been a few phrases that have, have been kicking around. Next generation hotspot, hotspot 2.0, uh, but just as we've done with um, Wi-Fi names, so you may have seen, um, you know, when we very first started Wi-Fi, it was Wi-Fi B. And then it was B stroke G and then N and then, you know, and so on and a AC and AX and all of that. It was getting very, very um, confusing for consumers. It, it literally was very, very, you know, it, is AX better than AC? But, you know, is N not higher than A alphabetically? So it was just getting really, really confusing for for everybody. Um, so we've gone now uh, with, with with numbers. So we have Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6, specificated Wi-Fi 6E, which is extended frequencies and uh, things like that. Um, but the, 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 uh, so the, the way we've come to do it within the terms now is that we're all referring to the next generation really as the word pass point. Passpoint okay. is, 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 if you like, the brand that we're going to take forward. We've gone past all of the specification created and all of the, you know, how does it work and all of the test cases, all the proof of concepts. And it's now a very mature technology. And that technology now is being deployed in, in lots and lots of areas, venues, organizations. 
Okay. And then if we go back to the the uh, teddy bear scenario, uh, and we have all of these IoT devices, and we have um, the Syria uh, Alexa and, and Cortana type uh, tools out there, what are your thoughts on specifically those three? I mean, would you absolutely not sometimes, um, always, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so again, coming back to that teddy bear, uh, you know, you sort of set up that, that question really well, actually. The, you know, the Alexas, the series, the Cortanas, they are run and operated, excuse me, developed by reputable brands. You know, we all know the names behind the organizations behind those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, the, it sort of the teddy bear was, was just a soft teddy bear company. Uh, mm. I won't name names, but they weren't known for technology. Right. You know, they, they'd, they'd managed to get a chipset and a, a web development team. And, you know, but, but it sort of comes back to that reputable company, the awareness that, you know, that, that teddy bears, well, it doesn't get software updates for, for a right. start. It's, it, it doesn't get software updates. The app might, uh, but I don't know, you know, the quality of the back end of that, that company, you know. Do they have a security team? Are they monitoring it? Are they, you know, doing their own internal training? Are they all of the kind of security things that we need to look at? I, I don't know with confidence that they are doing that. But, you know, the ones you mentioned, the Alexas and the, the uh, Google Voice and Katana and things right. like that, they are run by reputable companies who are so much in the public eye that they have to keep on top of that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I use that technology. I, I will often speak to, you know, uh, ask her to play me a song or something like that. And, you know, I, I'm quite comfortable using that technology because of the brand that sits behind it. However, what I will say is, and this is this is sort of my inner geek. Um, and forgive me for using that phrase. I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but I consider myself a geek. I don't mind that. Um, I do separate my home Wi-Fi out because I have that skill set. Now, I completely appreciate that, that not everybody has that, that, that skill set, but I do sit a lot of my IoT devices on a different network segment to what my other devices are. Just, just for that just in case moment that something does happen to something. You know, uh, you, you, you mentioned voice there, but there, there's so many IoT devices that are coming into people's homes. You know, it could be um, Nest is another big brand. They have cameras, they have smoke detectors, they have temperature controls. Uh, and we're bringing them inside our homes and attaching them to our networks all the time. Um, again, reputable brands, but there are cheaper alternatives. And often people will buy a cheaper alternative thinking it's going to do the same thing. But I would just just err on this side of caution, do some do, do some background checks. You know, are they known for that? Do, do they have a support base? Do they issue firmware updates? And the same comes to the MDUs. You know, a, a, a dwelling inside an MDU is really just a small, it's just it's, it's your home. You are bringing those devices in, you know, smart fridges, uh, energy controls, uh, light. But Maybe we can back up a little bit and explain how those can be some type of vector for uh, attack. I mean, you know, how can they be abused? Um, do you mean the voice? The, the voice. Uh, I'm just talking about all these different, all these I IoT devices that you're that you're talking about. Because the, the, to me, the the voice is, it's a little more obvious. Like you, you gave the really good example of you know you were sending a message to your daughter and they get all that type of information that you're not there. You got her name. Uh, wait, they know when you're going to be back, etc. Um, and I, you know, I can imagine uh, you know, my boys. Uh, they use Alexa all the time for everything. What's you know, put that song on. What's the temperature? What's the score? Whatever, right? <laughs> like, so. Um, um, and so I basically, whenever I ask them a question, they ask their phone and they get an answer, right? So I said, well, I can just answer my, my yeah, phone. Why don't you? And I'm like, well, because I, I got yeah. you to do it. So anyway, uh, but I think it's a little less obvious with, you know, how is my refrigerator going to harm me, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the one I often talk about is like, you know, things like the thermostat, for example. Uh, and this this is in the home or the MDU environment. You know, when we talk about a smart home, Thermostat is one of the things that's typically on that list, being able to control the temperature of the room or the property. 
uh, and doing the smart, intelligent things. You know, from a, from a landlord's perspective, if he's got a room that's empty in the middle of summer, he wants the temperature to be off. There's no point right. wasting uh, energy and uh, on that. But yet, when it comes to a winter and it's empty and there's a chance of frost, he wants it to come on just enough so that the pipes don't freeze and uh, those kinds of things. Um, but if you could access the thermometer, the, the th sorry, thermometer, the thermostats of uh, let's say a hotel or a MDUs. We're talking about MDUs in one of the you know the, the use cases. If you could talk and those thermostats could be breached, could I turn the heating on full until such time as a ransom is paid, or it could just be an annoyance, or it could be that they turn out that those 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 thermostats, um, you know, turning something off when it's winter um, whilst it could be that kind of um, uh, play where it's felt as that might just be an inconvenience actually that inconvenience could still be life-threatening what if it's a person that you know uh, could get hypothermia could get pneumonia because they can't turn their heating on or something like that now you'd like to think and I would like to think again I'm not here to scare anybody I'd like to think there is override functionality on there but depends on the level of complexity of that thermostat you know and if I get into one as those thermostats then within that building sat on the same VLAN or the same network could I get into all of them could the same thing be you know we look back at uh, historical with things like the the, 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 the wanna cry virus and things like that where it would just spread prof proliferately across all the devices that it could connect to uh, and infect and they become then and the 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 other thing is, it might not be that device that causes the concern. It could be that once that's that's the bridge, that's the gateway into that particular home or that network. So my my laptop that um, you know, or, or you you've got two laptops in that location, um, you know, a family complex. You share a folder across your NAS server or, or if you've got a NAS or a, a storage device or you're just sharing a folder on your device with inside what you think is a safe network it's your own network so I don't put a username and password on that particular share that I share with my wife or something like that because I believe I'm in a secure network but could that thermostat could that smart telly could that refrigerator if it's breached give access into that network as a, as a jump box as a jump host um, well, actually, I, in the U.S., I think of, 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 there was a very famous case with Target, the um, you know the variety store, department store, that their HVAC system uh, was compromised. I think there was a chip on there, um, and that served as a vector to get access to their point of sale or their POS system. And I can't remember how many, you know, millions of p individuals data was um, was compromised. And, yeah. and so, and, 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 you know, who would think? And, and I think it was the case that the HVAC controller um, just hadn't been, ha they hadn't installed the, the most recent patch. Right. The, 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 it could have been the firmware update like you were talking about before. And, 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 and again, on any CISO's list of, you know, a thousand things to do, Who's thinking about? Did we update the firmware for, or the you know, for, or for the HVAC system, right? So, <laughs> but yeah. you got to think about it, right? You you have to think about these these, these things. You know, um, basically, if it's got a plug on it, you ought to be a, a sorry a power plug. Then you mm -hmm. ought to be asking questions. Can it do anything? And as you said, you know, what what possibly could my fridge do? Well, actually, your fridge could be the one way into an organization. As you said, the HVAC chip. It's yep. it, it wasn't it wasn't that they were using the HVAC to do any uh, damage within the HVAC system. They were using it as a jump box into the rest of the network. You, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking that I'm never going to look at teddy bears or refrigerators. <laughs> <laughs> again, in the I same way. Ever again. Now I when I see them, I'm thinking, you, what are you up to, to Mr. Teddy Bear there? <laughs> yeah, but, I, uh, I, don't, I, I don't want to scare people. I just want to raise awareness. That you know, we we all need to be aware of that. Wherever we sit within that that, that ecosystem, whether we're a homeowner, we're a landlord, we're a you know a, a big CEO of an organisation or something like that, we do need to look at those kinds of things, you know, and and understand that that there's so many companies out there who don't 
either think that security is their con is a concern to them, you know, uh, or you know, you get small companies that go, well, you know, not a big target. I'm sorry, you, you know, you're, you, it might not be you as an individual that they're coming. Your device may be. You know, uh, I, I think uh, I'm trying to think who get, who gave the stats. I think it was Semantic uh, who, who who put a, put a cyber security report out there that a device, you know, uh, that has an IP address or is addressable on the internet will be scanned over five thousand times a month for vulnerabilities. You know, yeah. and it could be just something that you know, if if you're in charge of networks, you can see that port scans and things like that are happening all the time. And it's what information that that gives those particular bad actors. It might be, you know, uh, PHP is a, is a common web programming language out there. You know, typically your web server will respond with the version it has on it, unless you've hardened it, you know, made it as secure as you can. Uh, and that that person running that script is building a database of all the people that are running. I'm using that one example, but that particular piece of software that version number. Now, if a vulnerability is then found for that piece of software, they immediately know where are the first ones I can go and attack. And they, they don't necessarily pick, you know, based on this is the, you know, they might not even know that that's the CEO or uh, it's, 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 At some point, it's just a numbers game, right? I mean, they're going to send out, if you look at like the social engineering or phishing campaigns, they're just sending it out to, and how many people are going to click? Sometimes they're more well informed. They know you're a, a customer of a particular bank or a particular yeah. website, yeah. Um, and 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 they're going to send out, hey, you know what, your account's pin compromised. We need you to re-verify. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Or hey, you know, you yeah. you, you, you have a, a unpaid balance, or we're going to have to free you, whatever it is. And and they know if they send it to enough people, they're going to yeah. Is. The, the, so going to respond. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you, you know exactly right with the phishing and things like that. You know, you look at like Netflix or Amazon Prime or something like that. You see those kinds of included in those phishing kind of things because most people will have a Netflix account or an Amazon exactly. Prime account or yeah, that just because again, it, yes, exactly right. It's it's the numbers game. It's that mm -hmm. numbers game that they want. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Um, when it comes to you know uh, smart building and smart apartment security, uh, tell us a little bit about what Global Reach does or any solutions that you know that you provide. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so so on the Global Reach side, we're more around the user authentication, um, mm -hmm. so the radius, the AAA, the identity provision, and those kinds of things like that. Where we look at the nomadics, um, probably more known in the industry for the gateways. Um, so again, you go back to an MDU, um, you want to segregate the traffic in, of each tenant into their own little personal bubble. Uh, we used to use PAN as a, as a personal area network as a thing, uh, but, but they're, they're, they're going to have a small, their own private LAN as part of the overall complex, broken down, locked down into that. And that's really where the Nomadics Gateway has that capability to you know each tenant can be on their own vlan uh it can it doesn't care whether the delivery method is wi-fi or ethernet um so it can sit there at the you know the heart of that and you, you know a, a device becomes compromised in a network and this brings me on to the kind of the things that i think people need to be uh aware of um when you're building a network in an MDU environment or any environment, really, it's not just a case of build it, test it, walk away from it. It's, there's a, unfortunately, there is a constant process that needs to be there all the time. You know, we, we spoke about it before, firmware update, patching, you know, keeping on those mail, as, as simple as keeping on the mailing list with those uh, vendors so you can be notified if a new patch comes out and how you should apply that. Um, now, an MDU, I would typically expect them to go with a partner, a reputable partner that is going to look after, maintain, and monitor that network. Um, and when it when it comes to the like the Nomadics gateway, that becomes that sort of hot box. It's got that ability in there that if a network or a tenant hasn't uh, 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 a virus or a vulnerability detected on them. The nomadics can protect that from the rest of the, it can shut that VLAN down if it needs to. Something needs to trigger that 
but some of the, but it can it can shut that VLAN down. It can segment that traffic. It can push that user off that net or that device. It can block it from the network, so it can't do further damage. Whilst worst case, somebody needs to knock on the door of the the the, the, the building and say, yeah, you've got a device that we've had to push off your network. Hopefully, you would have a few more higher level automation systems than that. But I'm I'm just trying to show you know how how basic it could be but when it comes to that that's one of the things that nomadics the nomadic gateway is, is very good at bandwidth policy um again going back to an mdu you might be bringing a, a gig pipe into a building or a, even more into a building the amount of data that you can get into that building is coming in somewhere it's segmented between the tenants uh you don't want one tenant you know that's got uh eight children in there all at university <laughs> and they've got you know right. laptops and, and smartphones and devices and then somebody's torrenting bit torrenting and you know five 4k streams going off and then you've got somebody you know in a different flat all they want to do is check their, their bank balance but they can't get there because there's no internet connectivity because there is but it's Something all being is. consumed somewhere else yeah. so the nomadics box has all these capabilities of fair policy uh, it can do it on the fly. It can, you know, if if nobody's consuming the bandwidth, then it can go somewhere else. Or if the landlord or tenant only wants to sell, let's say, a hundred meg circuit per flat, then it can be cut into that shape and given to those. So really, if you think, you know, global reach, we do captive portals, we do public Wi-Fi, we do passpoint, we do our identity provision, those kinds of things. The nomadics is is more around that hardware, that gateway. Uh, to do all of that together works really really well together hand in hand kind mm -hmm. of thing um, well, I'm, I'm just curious like at, at what size uh of a complex or mdu should you know owners or operators start to to look for these types of solutions uh really honestly anything more than a you know if, if there's two families you know if it's if it's a single dwelling if it's a single house then obviously i would put that into more of the home wi-fi and those kinds of things uh, but when you come to the multi-dwelling units two or more properties ought to be two or more uh, dwellings with inside the same ought to be looking at something like that because you've got um uh cyber security to think of. you've also got privacy you know i i don't want the ability of on my phone to you know uh, right i'm going to cast this movie from my netflix on my laptop to my screen and actually hang on i can see another google chromecast somewhere click and it's it's broadcasting somebody else's you know apartment so segmenting networks uh down uh there are smaller you know you don't need to go to a, a large uh, so I, I don't want to talk too much about nomadics, but we have small units as well as large units to do those kinds of things. There are other vendors out there as well that do those kinds of things. But you know, segmenting that traffic, people should think about segmenting that traffic properly. You know, there's the smart devices that are part of the building's infrastructure should be completely segmented from all the tenant traffic. And, and there's numerous ways to do that. Probably don't want to go into that on this call, but you know, a reputable network provider would understand the requirements and look mm -hmm. at that thermostats. They might even break them down per floor in those buildings, you know, separate VLANs per floor. So mm -hmm. you're looking at containment as well. So should an incident happen, you're looking at, you know, you want to contain it without affecting you know, hundreds of rooms, hundreds of guests, hundreds of those kinds of things. So, yeah, um, yeah so security, you know, whether there's one person, two people, three, four, security should be there all the time. Yeah. Excellent. I think that's some 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 excellent advice. I changed tracks just a bit here, and uh, and I cognizant of the fact that we're we're kind of running up on our time here. But uh, is Airbnb and you know business uh, platforms like that is that fairly popular uh, in the UK? And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I hear there, you know pre-COVID and now it's starting to be, you know, go back online again. Um, but when you roll into somebody's house or apartment and you're using their Wi-Fi, um, is there something that you should be thinking about? I, I guess it's probably similar to the public Wi-Fi, but it might be slightly different because it's not a public Wi-Fi. It's, yeah, 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 it's a valid point, you know, uh, and again, it's, it's another one of those use cases that ought to be looked at uh, because, yes, you're right. Typically, the, you know, you get given a little handbook as you 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 enter the property and it's a hey this is the wi-fi password and 
you know, the, those... kids, the kids, that's the first thing they do go for yeah. when they get in there. <laughs> it's either the, the fridge, that evil fridge, or the, uh, <laughs> or, or the, uh, or the, 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 what's the Wi-Fi password? I need the Wi-Fi, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and it's, it's just, you know, understanding, you know, those kinds of things again is, you know, who has control of that? And I know it's, it's something you typically wouldn't ask the Airbnb and go, you know, hey, is it your Wi-Fi service? Is it your ISP's Wi-Fi service or whatever? Again, just, just common common sense, you know. It, yes, it's encrypted. That's one of the things done. But you don't know who manages that router. Does that router store logs? Does that, you know, those kinds of things. Does the person well, and then you think about it, last it's... week still have the same Wi-Fi password and could actually be stood outside the front door? Exactly. Or could have one of the previous guests gone in there and set something up so that they're able to, you know, capture you information. You could, you, could have, you could have these guys... Now we're going to freak people out about Airbnb, but you have people that just that just travel around and go to different Airbnb places and, you know, get, get sitting there for a, a day, setting it up so that they can do whatever with their uh, router or, or or and or other things. Yeah. Wow. OK, <laughs> but I'm sure it's not all that bad. Just be careful. Be aware. That's what you're saying. Yeah, right? Just be aware. Common, common sense. You know, you know, if there's, if there's cable, you know, you could go if there's cables coming out of the back of the router. You know, where do they go? If one goes to the telly and, you know, one disappears through the floor, where is it going? And what's it there for? Just, right. just, just be you know, sensible around there. Use the similar kind of precautions you would in public Wi-Fi. You know, why, why wouldn't you? If you've got a VPN client on your device, why wouldn't you use that if it's, you know, certainly if you're, you know, again, working remotely or something like that, we're all we're all sort of in that phase anyway. So we're all more aware to remote working and things like that. But just be aware of those kinds of uh, you know, things that you can do. Keep your keep your um, you know, come down to your personal laptop, make sure it's running the latest software. You know, is it patched? You know, I go back to those if it's Windows, you know, have you run Windows update recently? You know, right. I've seen so many devices that have come across my desk in years of doing this. And, you know, it's like, oh, this little thing keeps popping up at the top, you know, telling me I've got this update. Well, I just keep swiping it off. I'm, I'm, but I can't make it do this. And you're thinking, you know, people don't create those security patches just because we've got nothing else to do. Or, you know, the industry, they are trying to help us, but we also need to help ourselves to a certain degree kind of thing Absolutely. and do those. Keep, keep, keep them up to date. Uh, make sure you know you, you're running your personal firewall. There's nothing wrong with having a personal firewall, having it enabled. Why wouldn't you? You know, again, I've seen devices come across my uh, desk years and years ago when I was working, you know, as a junior, and firewalls would be disabled. Oh, I thought it might slow my machine down, so I disabled it. Right. You know, why? Why would we build those things into technology? You know, to do those kinds of things. So it is. It, it, it always comes down to that. 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 My, my biggest point that I like people to take away, I don't want to scare people. I want to make people more aware and more conscious to look for those things. There are many, many helpful resources out there uh, on, on the Internet. Or if you don't want, you know, if it's not Internet, you can buy a book, you know, read or educate yourself. Become more aware of these kinds of things. You know, as, as you said earlier, you know, you've got people. What, 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 what can my fridge possibly do? You know, it, it, they might turn it off and my food waste. OK, I'll go down to, you know, Waitrose or wherever and buy some more food and put it into the fridge. So what? But you know, what it could do is it could access other things. It's you brought that inside your network, inside your property, inside your apartment. It, if it had an issue, then Again, I don't want to scare people. I just want people to be aware that, you know, if there's a button that says, you know, there's an update, verify that the update is real and genuine, obviously, you know, because we've all seen those adverts over the years. You know, you've got one new mail waiting for you. You know, um, right. I, I've had people that would click them and, you know, it's an advert and, you know, they're, they're, they're into that kind of thing. Marketing and, and malware and phishing and all of that. It's a, it's a very skilled you know, uh, ecosystem that is out there. It's adapting all the all the time. The threat landscape is changing literally by the minute. You know, there's new things coming out uh, all the time, and people are playing on things like urgency. You know, if you if you just read up about phishing, for example, you know, and how you know they play on urgency, speed. Absolutely. You know, Hey, I need this right now, for, you know, signed to the boss, you know, and, and using a, an email address that looks very similar to the boss's or whatever, you know, and yeah, yeah, it just, 
they, they're, they're pretty good at it. Uh, but I, what I'm hearing you say is, one, security is everybody's responsibility. It's not just the CISO in the back office and his team. It's everybody's responsibility. And the first you know, rule of, of security is that we all need to just be aware, you know, and uh, yeah. Just, just, yeah, yeah, literally that. Just that they would be, you know, the, the one thing that I would love somebody to take away from this is just that thought of, you know what, I'm just going to go and check my devices are running the latest firmware. You know, that, right. that would be a great takeaway from, you know, our conversation that we've just had now, because if we can do that, we can get people up that ladder. Um, there's, some, there's some really, um, you know, we've had IoT devices for five years. And I, again, jokingly about the teddy bear as we're finishing off. Um, you know, I never once received an update. Right. No. Yeah, just, that's, uh... that's got to make questions start to ring in everybody's mind. You know, is my smart fridge receiving updates? And, you know, Again, I don't want to scare the audience. That's that's not what I want to do. I just want to make people more aware, more cognitive of security in general. I I think that's a great message to kind of wrap this up with. And uh, Chris, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, this is super valuable information for our listeners. Thank you so much for your time today. No problem, Mark. Thank you so much. Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance.